So today uh, we're going to talk about dimension reduction and uh, a celebrated result called the Johnson Linden Strauss lemma. So um, dimension reduction and the Johnson Linden Strauss lemma. Sort of a very important theorem in, uh, you know, sort of about, about vectors, <coughs> which has lots of applications uh, in data analysis and in a lot of recent advances in faster, um, faster algorithms for numerical linear algebra. So uh, here's the setting. So we are given uh, n points, which I will think of as vectors, v1, v2, up to vn, and r to the d. <coughs> so think of n is large and d is large. So d, you know, might even be, you know, sort of as large as n. So can we get a low dimensional low dimensional representation that I'll say approximately preserves geometric geometric structure something that approximately preserves geometric structure. So specifically what I mean is we want to construct what is called an embedding. Construct an embedding. So an embedding is going to be a map from R to the D to R to the K. So D is the original dimensionality where we think of K as potentially as much smaller than D, such that, um, <clears throat> and let me say, let me also set a parameter epsilon, which is going to be, let's say, you know, at most a half, something small, such that the Euclidean distance in VI and VJ. Um, or let me let me write this out separately. I'll say I can take the Euclidean distance of the embedding vectors, and I want this. I don't even put the square there. So I want this Euclidean distance to basically be within one plus minus epsilon of the original Euclidean distance. And I want this to happen, you know, so for all i, j. Okay, I'm going to refer to this as condition one, just for convenience. This is this is condition one for i and j. So I want to construct a map that's an embedding, which is from R to the d, which is the high dimensional space, to R to the k, where k is a low dimensional space, such that the Euclidean distance between the points in the embedded space is essentially approximately the same as the Euclidean distance in the original space. So does this notion of an embedding make sense? So this is what it means to approximately preserve the geometric structure. All pairwise distances, all pairwise distances are approximately are approximately preserved right so any any questions about that good question so I, I'll come to that with prob with uh, I'll come to the high probability condition
Yeah, so that that's the remarkable uh, theorem of the Johnson Linden Strauss lemma that you'll see that you'll see the statement and you'll see the proof. So um, it is, you know, at first blush, quite surprising that something like this should even be possible. So <coughs> the the theorem, and this was proven by Johnson and Linden Strauss, uh, I think, uh, decades ago, and then since then there have been simpler proofs and you know and um, and stronger proofs, and this is often referred to as just the JL lemma. And it's a lemma because you know because of its utilities in so many places. So for any set of points v1 to vn in r to the d, and for all epsilon this so actually I so I should go back and um, sorry I, I think I someone had asked like is this preservation with probability one or what is the probability I mean for a fixed embedding you know there is no notion of probability in this statement I just want this to happen for an embedding does that make sense so there's no probability I want this to happen for all pairs so the first question is even does there exist such an embedding and the second question is if there exists an embedding can be constructed efficiently. So does that answer uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so for any set of points, sorry, which is countable? I'm just going to state a theorem here, right? So this is this is uncountable, right? It's any set of points. Oh, the index. Yeah, yeah, it's oh, well, you mean sorry, I'm sorry. You mean that way. Yes, it's it's a countable set of points, but it's it's a finite set of points, not countable. It's finite. It's finite. Um, yeah, so it's it's a finite set of points. So n is fixed, right? So I say that I have n points in d-dimensional space. Um, then there exists a linear transformation. So JL is actually promising you not just that there's some embedding, but there's actually a linear embedding where K is at most so I'm just going to put in some constants here to make this explicit, such that for all ij condition 1 holds. <coughs> okay? So at this point, there is no probability in this statement. I'm just saying there exists a linear transformation. So this is somewhat remarkable. Not only is there a transformation, there's actually a linear transformation where the dimensionality is it depends only it's only logarithmic in n but you pay an epsilon squared depend depending on your parameter approximation parameter and this 1 over epsilon squared that you see is the same 1 over epsilon squared that we saw for estimating you know uh, biases of a coin so you'll see that this the the sort of Chernoff type concentration which gives you the epsilon square is going to reappear here and you have an extra factor of log n but it's logarithmic in the number of points so for any constant epsilon you only need logarithmic dimension to preserve all pairwise distances all pairwise distances and there is a linear transformation no there exists a linear transformation where k is small Obviously, if k is greater than that, k could just be n. Right? So there is a low dimensional embedding. Okay, so, so the theorem should surprise you. Right? Because you're preserving all pairwise distances with a linear transformation into something that only depends on 
epsilon and the, you know the dependence on n is so weak it's just logarithmic and what is even more remarkable as if this wasn't enough is you could say okay so how to construct how to construct phi so remarkably it can be done without the knowledge of v1 to vn <coughs> so I can actually construct phi it can be done in a randomized in a randomized manner and this is where the power of randomization comes in that you can actually construct this map using randomization without knowing what v1 to vn are and basically phi is a random linear transformation and now you have a notion of probability now you have a notion of probability but you can argue that essentially with high probability with high probability and it's easy to boost this like let's just say for now we can just make it two-thirds but it's easy to boost it to whatever we want you know phi will satisfy conditions of the theorem so I will tell you I mean now I will describe how to construct a random linear transformation but for now I want to make sure that this lemma the JL lemma makes sense and you understand it and you also understand the sort of remarkable point here that this dimension reduction can actually be done completely agnostic to the set of points whereas you would think like you know you have to look at the points to figure out what the right transformation is but remarkably assuming ra with randomization just a random linear transformation will work with high probability okay any questions or clarifications Alright, so <clears throat> let me now describe the actual transformation. So what's, um, you know, I will, uh, yes. Uh, just, um, is it possible to do it, like, deterministically with, like, I guess it should be possible to do it deterministically with looking at the points? That's a good question. You know, it's actually, it's n not as obvious that you can convert the randomized algorithm into a deterministic one. That's actually, uh, it, it's quite not true. You can, it, but it is true that there are deterministic constructions. But the deterministic constructions, you know, sort of came after the JL lemma came out. The deterministic constructions are fairly intricate. Kind of, so you basically have to construct certain, like, linear transformations that have specific properties. And so then, you know, you kind of have to use certain methods to construct such linear transformations. Um, <clears throat> and, and there is, you know, there is a fair bit of recent work on constructing these things which are referred to as um, JL, well, they're actually referred to as matrices with something called the restricted isometry property. So there are certain specific properties that you can specify on the matrix and say if it satisfies these these properties, then it will do the dimension reduction. And so, um, but anyway, so let's uh, let let let's let me first explain. Yes. With re with respect to some group of vectors, right? So you would specify the vectors. You would have to specify the vectors in advance. Okay, so how is this going to work? So uh, I'm going to write out, as I usually write my points out, 
as column vectors of a matrix. So this is V1 to Vn. Each column is a vector of this matrix. So this is an N times D matrix. My linear transformation is going to be this matrix, which, you know, is basically just phi. So I'm just going to denote that that's going to be my random matrix. And so what I can think of is I have a collection of rows here. So I have k rows, and this is k times d. And so what I end up with when I multiply these is I will get a k times n matrix, right? So, so what I want to think about is here's my vector. I input this vector to this map. So what, what, what each entry is, so this is my low dimensional representation. So what is the map phi of vi? <coughs> That's just going to be the map where the jth entry, the jth entry here is I look at the vector and I take a dot product with the jth row. And so the jth row, you know, I could say is phi j star. Right? And this is a vector here. So I'm taking each vector and I dot product it. I take the dot product with k independent random vectors. And each entry, OK, so I'm going to give you sort of the basic structure. You can actually, there, you have a lot of flexibility in how to choose the entries. But for now, let's specifically take each entry of phi is a is basically it's a ra it's a random gaussian it's a uh, gaussian random variable right so it's a gaussian random variable and essentially distributed with this so the mean is 0 and the variance is 1 so i'm going to basically just take a random gaussian whose mean is 0 variance is 1 and each entry is an independent sample from the Gaussian is an independent Gaussian random variable so that's how I'm going to construct phi and then what we'll show is that with high probability phi satisfies our conditions phi is the linear random linear transformation so another way of thinking about this is I construct k vectors k vectors in R to the D, where each entry, each entry is generated independently, generated independently from a Gaussian, the normal distribution. So I generate these k vectors, and then the map is obtained by taking dot products with each of these vectors. That's the map, right? So I'm going to generate these k vectors in the beginning. And then every time I get points, I'm just, you know, for every point, I'm just going to take a dot product with each of these. So what's nice about this is because you don't even need to know what the points are in advance, you can even do this in an incremental setting. Like you can generate phi up in advance and then the vectors might be arriving. And as long as your k is large enough to get certain probabilistic conditions to hold, this is going to work with high probability. Right, so it doesn't depend on the set of points. You just chose a bunch of random vectors here. And this is really one of um, the powers 
of randomness. Like it's such a simple, elegant algorithm. So any questions about that? Okay. <clears throat> now, before we continue, uh, and it turns out that actually you don't really need things to be perfectly Gaussian. There is an immense amount of flexibility in what these random variables are. Uh, I don't want to get into that right now. So for, let's say, you know, at least for the first half of the lecture, let's just assume things are Gaussians. I will tell you the specific properties of Gaussians that you need. And then we'll see that, you know, any random variable that satisfies some set of conditions can be used to generate this matrix. Okay. So before we, before we continue, let's just take a short digression into the properties of the Gaussian distribution. Properties of Gaussians. So if you look at the normal distribution, so this is mean zero, variance sigma square, the probability density function, and you may have seen this, is 1 divided by sigma root 2 pi e to the minus x squared divided by 2 sigma squared. Okay, So the, the way to think about what this distribution is doing is look at, look at this value here. You know, if x, if um, x is less than sigma, x is less than sigma, then e to the minus x squared divided by 2 delta square is basically theta of 1. <coughs> right? So what this says is, if you look at it going from minus sigma to sigma, the probability density function is just, it's basically a constant. I mean, there is some change depending on whether x is 0 or sigma, but it's basically that. Now, if x is more than k times sigma, then e to the minus x squared divided by 2 um, <coughs> sigma squared. I mean, this is, again, this is the probability density function. It's not the probability. It's the probability density function. But still, it gives you some intuition as to what's going on. Then this is going to be less than e to the minus k squared divided by 2. And this is your drop off. Okay? So a convenient you know, just a mental picture to have of a Gaussian is 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 just this. Between between the standard deviation or some constants times the standard deviation is essentially flat. You know, approximately. Once you go more than k times the standard deviation, then it starts dropping off over here. Now, you know, using moment generating functions which you know maybe I'll try to talk about towards the end of class you can prove some of this formally so I'm just gonna state this formally because we will use these statements or we will use this intuition and then um, if, if, if you want I can give some notes on how to prove these formally so let's just say that you know there's a random variable Z which is generated from the Gaussian so again, it's convenient to center things at zero, right? So these are all these are all symmetric uh, random variables. So the probability that z is more than k times sigma is at most two to the minus e to the minus k squared divided by two. Okay. So this is one of the key properties of uh, of this and this actually is works for all k. This works for um, for all k greater than zero. Okay, so this is this is this is this looks a lot like Chernoff. I mean, and for good reason that one of the things that the Chernoff bound does is to show that this tail bound also applies to the binomial distribution or to in general sums of bounded independent random variables. Right, so this is. I'll call it, this is again, this is very reminiscent of the Chernoff bound and for good reason. Indeed, the, the proof to this that I will show you can also be used to prove the Chernoff bound. 
So this is the tailbone, and the second is the linear combination property. So the linear combination property says, suppose z1 to zr are independent Gaussians with, you know, with variances sigma 1 to sigma r, uh, sigma 1 square to sigma r square, then running out of space here but um, you know for, for all alpha i's which are an r summation of alpha i z i is also a Gaussian right and the variance the variance is sort of what you what you expect here so it's summation of alpha i square sigma i square so sorry this is maybe I'll zoom in a bit over here okay so this is saying that if you take a linear combination of independent Gaussian random variables then the resulting random variable is also a Gaussian and whose variance whose variance essentially is you know the sum is the sum of squares of the variances of each individual and that's just you know because the variance of a sum of independent random variables is the sum of variances so this part is actually pretty easy the harder part is to show that it's still a gaussian okay so these are sort of the properties of gaussians that you need to know and using this you know, and a f few other things that I'm going to shove under the rug and then probably bring back out towards the end, I will show you how to prove the Johnson and Strauss lemma. So any questions about this? Again, I would encourage, like, don't worry about the specifics of the, uh, of the calculus over here, right? The important thing to know is that Gaussians have a tail bound, and the tail bound says that deviating more than k times the standard deviation has probability which is exponentially small in minus k squared right and secondly a linear combination of gaussians is also a gaussian and it's easy to look at you know what the variance of that resulting gaussian is okay and uh, these can be proven using the moment generating function and I will try to maybe I will see if, if depending on if we have time I might talk about some of these or just give you some notes some pointers to this okay any questions okay so let's continue now and so now let's let me sort of abstract out the jail problem for now and simply consider you know an arbitrary uh, vector or point u in r to the d let us take what's called a random projection what a random projection means so generate a uniform at random vector x in r to the d and then we're looking at the dot product u dot x but, but how do you actually generate a random vector? What does it mean to generate a random vector? So we would like a rotationally, rotationally symmetric distribution. So what I mean by that is if you think about space, what you would ideally like is that 
let's say all points in the unit sphere all points in the unit sphere should have exactly the same probability of being chosen right so you want the sort of symmetries that no matter how you rotate the axes you know whatever distribution you have should look the same and it turns out there's a very convenient way of doing this which is exactly using Gaussians so here's my random variable vector x which I will denote as x1 to xd where each xi is chosen from the normal distribution 0 1 independently I believe I've been using um, let me use j to index my dimensions okay so if you look at the probability density function the probability density function for x right so we can say what is the probability density function for getting f of x1 to xd now because they're independent Gaussians you're just going to multiply the density functions for each of the Gaussians so you're gonna get you know some sort of some sort of constant term over here and the constant term will be something like you know 1 divided by um, 2 pi to the d over 2 but this is this is independent of x and then what you get is the probability for all j in d of e to the minus and remember the variance I've set to be 1 summation xi square divided by 2 now what is this quantity here what is that quantity there if I were to think of this as a vector x what is that it's the Euclidean squared norm so what does that mean it means that all vectors of the same length have exactly the same probability this is the rotational symmetry here in other words the probability density function for some x is some constant term independent of x so this is independent of x e to the minus Euclidean norm squared divided by 2 so do you see this is rotationally symmetric so this is how we're going to generate random vectors and this is exactly what we did for JL for the JL problem as we discussed I said that you know we are going to choose each of the entries here as random Gaussians and when you think of it what does that mean it means that each row of that matrix of the embedding matrix each row of the matrix is just a random vector generated according to this distribution and this distribution is convenient it also makes a lot of sense because it's just a random vector right it's in some sense the equivalent of a uniform random vector which is rotationally symmetric of course the norm of this vector is not necess is not going to be one so there's some distribution of norms you could think about normalizing it so that the norm is back to one but that turns out to be not particularly important for us okay so does this does this make sense I mean it's important that you kind of understand the intuition behind using Gaussians and the key is this you get this rotational symmetry is because what appears in the probability density function is the two norm is the length and the length the, the, the Euclidean norm is rotationally symmetric okay any questions Yeah, th this is. I mean, yes. I mean, because if you if you think about, if you think about it, like if you were choosing coordinates independently, then you would have the sum of some function of x, and you want that function of x to essentially 
you know, essentially th this is th it has to be the same for all vectors of the same length. So then you could try you could do some calculus on that to derive that it has to be something like this. It has to be some function of that. Yeah. Um, again, the rotational symmetry is not going to be particularly important for us because interestingly, you know, it, it turns out that you can do a lot here. You can actually instead of picking it to be a Gaussian, you can essentially pick it from any what I will call well-behaved distribution with this mean and variance and all the math goes through. So even if you choose distributions that are not rotationally symmetric, a lot of the math will go through. Uh, and indeed, you know, in some sense, this was discovered later and then there were these unified proofs that basically said you have a lot of flexibility in what you pick this to be. But I think it is useful also for you just to learn about the properties of Gaussians and to kind of understand why setting Gaussians here is natural. And it's natural because it's like just taking a random projection. You're picking a random vector and then you're just taking the dot product with that vector and you're going to do this a bunch of times. Okay, so let me zoom out a bit over here. Okay. Uh, all right, so now consider the random projection. And so let me say, why is that random variable? So why is u dot x? This is the projection of u on a random vector. So I'm somewhat abusing the word projection here because the norm of x is not 1 but you know let, b bear with me for a while and then we'll you know we can fix those issues so let me just denote u as um, alpha 1 to alpha d right each alpha j is an r so what is u well u is going to be the summation of alpha j x um, I'm sorry, there's no vector xj, where j is in d, right? I'm just writing out what the dot product is. But this is distributed, distributed as a Gaussian, right? Because this is a linear combination of Gaussians with a variance Okay, with a variance of what? So let's go back and look at our statement about the linear combinations of Gaussians. We said the variance of the linear combination is the sum of alpha i squared, that's the weight squared, sigma i squared. But remember, sigma is just 1 because all of, we generated all these independent Gaussians with variance 1. So the variance over here is simply going to be the summation of alpha j squared. So my apologies, I've been sort of switching between i and j, but I want to keep j over here because j is the index for dimension and i was the index for the points. Okay, And what is this quantity now with respect to u? What is this? This is the Euclidean norm of u squared. Okay, so le okay, le 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 let's let's put this together and let me give you an immensely useful lemma. I says for any vector u r to the d u dot x. Okay, so what is x? Remember, x is a random Gaussian vector where each entry has a variance of 1. Right? u dot x is distributed is distributed as a Gaussian itself 
centered at zero with the variance being exactly the two norm squared. So the standard deviation of this Gaussian is exactly the length of the vector. Okay, does this lemma make sense? And do you see do you see the proof? The, I mean, I I didn't write this out formally in a lemma proof environment, but what I wrote here is the proof. So for the scribe, I would recommend that you write this out as a proof using the statements that we had earlier. Okay, so any questions about that? All right. So I reiterate this is a very important fact. It's one that will again appear when, you know, later on when we actually are going to do streaming algorithms, we will exploit this. So it says that if I have any vector and I take a random, I take a dot product of that vector with a random Gaussian vector. So the way to think of this is geometrically, I have my vector u over here. Now I'm going to apply the random Gaussian thing and I'm going to get some other vector x. Now the expected dot product is 0. Right, because this vector is equally likely to be here and here, in which case these dot products will cancel out. But the variance of the dot product is exactly going to be its length squared, Euclidean norm squared. And moreover, it's actually distributed as a Gaussian. And because it's distributed a Gaussian, you also have tail bounds. So you, you completely know what the distribution of dot products is. Okay. All right. So where you know, what is the relationship between all of this and JL? So let's go back to our picture. Remember, we are doing phi was our linear transformation, right? And phi was this random matrix. Remember, you you might wonder. Wait a second, that. I wanted to preserve the distances between vectors, whereas what I am talking about here is actually the projection of a specific vector. And it's I deliberately put u over here and not v, because I'm actually going to choose u to be, you know, like vi minus vj. So, so for now, I'm just trying to understand what does the length of the embedding look like? OK, what do I mean? So if I take my vector u, right? this is u. This is u, your single column vector. So this is u. This is phi over here. Each of these is a random Gaussian vector x1 to xk. OK? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to normalize this. So I'm going to multiply uh, get, all right, phi over here. I'm just going to normalize this by 1 divided by root k. And you'll see why. Because root k is essentially the expected length of these. So this is, this is just a normalization term. And the normalization term will become clear. But you know, if the normalization term bothers you, you can ignore it for now. So my matrix, my random matrix, was each row of the matrix, I have k rows, remember it's k times d, I have k rows, each row is a random Gaussian vector. And so what do I get here? So I started with something that was d-dimensional, this is now k-dimensional, and what I have here is that each of these is like xj dot u. Right? And so each of the entries over here is an independent independent Gaussian distributed from n the normal distribution with the variance being two norm squared. So I have a collection of k independent random Gaussians. Okay? 
Now, what I'm going to do, what I would like to do, is let me actually look at what the length of this vector is. So Euclidean norm squared. Okay? And this is just the sum of each individual entry squared, and each individual entry was was that. Now if you remember I put this normalization term over here so I'm also going to get the square of the normalization term so I'm going to get 1 divided by actually I'm sorry this should be k not d right because there are k of these there are k such um, k of these all right okay so I have k such dot products Now let me refer to this as yj, yj. So what I get here is 1 divided by k, the summation of, I'll say now, j less than k of yj squared, where yj was distributed as a normal. Okay, so that's what this looks like. So what is the expected value of the length of the projection? So this by linearity of expectation is just the expectation of each yj squared, the sum. So what is the expectation of yj squared? What is the expectation of yj squared? it's the norm of u squared because it's exactly the variance of that Gaussian. Okay, so the expectation is going to be k times the norm of u squared divided by k and that's why I did the normalization and so then the expectation behaves you know, essentially exactly as you want. Of course yj is a Gaussian, yj squared is not a Gaussian, it's actually yj squared is, the, is from the chi-square distribution. Okay, so now this random variable here, right? This is, so let me just ignore the 1 over k for now. What I'm looking at really is this, which is a sum of squares of independent independent Gaussians. So I know that the expectation of this random variable is my length. What I need is a tail bound. So we need or we will need tail bounds for the sums sum of squares of the independent Gaussians. For now let's just assume that we would get the tail bound that we expect with a Chernoff or basically a sub-Gaussian tail and then later on I can I can prove these things or I can show you how to do the proofs formally. But let's just hope that summation y i y j square behaves like we want. What do we want? We want tail bounds. So let's first understand. So we know that the expectation of this random variable is what we want. Let's look at the variance of the summation of yj squared. Now, because of independence, we know that this is just the summation over j less than uh, k of the variance 
of yj squared. What is the variance of a yj of yj squared going to be? Can, can you can you sort of hazard a guess as to what it what what do you think it should be? What do you think it should be? You know that yj is a Gaussian. Told you exactly what the Gaussian is. You know what the expectation of yj squared is. So let, but what should the variance of yj squared be? Is a chi square. That is not yj squared, but rather the sum of this is the chi square with k degrees of freedom. But but you know uh, you, yeah so you can you can okay go on yeah. So again, like you're right. I mean, you can you can you can dig up the formula, but I don't want you to dig up the formula. I want you to use your intuition about Gaussians. I want you to use your intuition about Gaussians. Okay, so let me let me let me write this out a bit. So let let me just look at the variance of y one squared, right? Because they're all they're independent, they're identical. Right. So what am I looking at here? I'm looking at the expectation of y1 to the fourth minus the expectation of y1 squared squared. Right. That's that's sort of that's sort of what I'm looking at. Yeah, that's sort of what you hope, exactly, right? So you think you're looking at your Gaussian here, right? It'll just be k times that. So for the so what's going on here is you know that most of the probability mass essentially lies, I mean, technically within two times uh, the Euclidean norm, right? That's 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 where all the that's where all the action is. Why is a Gaussian with that variance? It means mostly it's lying in here. So if you look at the fourth power, you know, because one way to think of a Gaussian is that it's basically like just a uniform distribution in this range. It's not a bad intuition to have that the Gaussian is essentially uniform within its standard deviation and zero everywhere else. It's good as a rule of thumb. So if you use by the rule of thumb, this is not a proof, and for those of you who complain that I'm not giving you the proof, my point is, I don't think the calculus or the algebra is as important. What's important is you have the right intuition, because when you have the right intuition, you can always dig up the math that you need to get the proof down. And we'll see that you know we can prove all of this formally using moment generating functions. But what it's what's important is to really understand that a Gaussian a rule of thumb for a Gaussian is that it's uniform within within minus sigma and plus sigma and zero outside. Right? This is very crude. It's a very crude approximation, but it's not a bad one. So by the rule of thumb, the variance of y square, you, you expect this is going to be something like O of the Euclidean norm to the fourth power. And so you say, well, you know, I, my guess is that the variance of the sum is going to be essentially O of k times to the fourth power. Therefore, the standard deviation and just remember this is the norm of the projection so you're taking the projection and you're looking at the norm and you see th the standard deviation is going to be the, the square root of this so this is o of square root of k 
So somebody might want to mu okay, yeah. So the standard deviation is just the square root of that. So now what we get is that now this is important, the standard deviation of the projection is like the Euclidean norm squared. The standard deviation is like the Euclidean norm squared. Whereas for yi, it was the variance that was Euclidean norm squared. Here the standard deviation is Euclidean norm squared. Okay, and I'm just going to write this down. I had written this down earlier. yj squared. This was u squared. So what we have is the expectation is the length. Uh, I'm s okay, so I fudged. Um, okay, so no, sorry, this is okay. Okay, sorry. The expectation, remember the, the, the final norm was obtained by multiplying with a normalization, but I'm ignoring the normalization. Right? I'm looking at the summation of yj squared. And when I look at the summation of yj squared, the expectation is k times the length squared whereas the standard deviation is square root k times the length and so now I can ask what is the probability what is the probability that summation over j y j squared minus the expectation now I do sort of my typical calculation. What is the probability this is going to deviate by more than epsilon times? Right? This is sort of the Chernoff type bound that I want. I want to say this deviation is actually a low probability event. So I write this. So now I'm going to do my, you know, I've, I've, I, I keep doing this calculation. So I say, let me look at this is the deviation. And I say, how many multiples of the standard deviation is it? So, well, okay, this I wrote as epsilon k, the Euclidean norm squared, right, which I write as epsilon square root k times square root k of the Euclidean norm squared. And this is an upper bound on the standard deviation. So I'll say this is omega of epsilon root k times the standard deviation of the summation of yj squared. So this is how many deviations I'm looking at. This, sorry, how many deviations of the standard deviation, right? So it's this epsilon root k standard deviations. Okay? Now, assuming concentration, assuming what I'll call a sub-Gaussian tail, which is a Chernoff type concentration, right? ideally, what you want to say is that this, you're deviating by these many standard deviations, so your probability you'll say is something like the square of this minus epsilon square k divided by some constant c. This is what we get. This observe is independent of the length. So the length, the Euclidean norm, has sort of completely disappeared from the equation. What you get is the probability, the probability that the norm of the projection so the expected value of the norm of the projection is essentially k times that without the normalization. So you can you can divide everything by k to normalize, but let's 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 keep it unnormalized. So the expectation is k times the length. The standard deviation is root k times I'm sorry, the length squared, length squared. And so you can assuming assuming concentration like a Gaussian. Like assuming this, of course we need to prove it, you get this. Alright? Okay, so let me rewrite this now. So now we're basically in business and we can 
we can essentially complete the argument. Now, I hesitate, you know, obviously this isn't a formal proof, but this is the basic JL argument. So I'm going to rewrite this over here. So, sorry, let me get that down over there. All right, so so let, let, let's, let's backtrack a bit, saying the probability that the projection squared is not in 1 plus minus epsilon of the actual norm squared. Right? That's, that's basically what I'm looking at here because the expected value of this is k times the projection. So I'm just dividing this entire equation by k and I come to this. I'm just dividing all of the k out over here to come to this. I'm saying the probability of this is expectation of minus epsilon squared k divided by c. So what I get is that for all u in r to the d, this property holds. Okay. Now what I'll do is I'm going to set k to be something like, let's say, 3 c natural log n divided by epsilon squared. And if I do that, this probability is going to be at most 1 divided by n cube. And now I apply this bound for all vi minus vj because I want to preserve the length of this vector so I'm just going to set this to be u. I'm going to apply this and so I can ask what is the probability that there exists an ij such that phi of vi minus phi of vj squared is not in 1 plus minus epsilon of vi minus vj squared. So what is the probability that there exists some pair? Now I do union bound. This is at most the sum over all ij of the probability of you know this phi of vi minus vj because this is a linear this is a linear map one plus minus epsilon I don't need this uh, vi minus vj squared All right so this is the probability that the embedding of vi minus vj has a length which is not in its sort of expected length but this we just proved over here because you know this is u and so this is at most summation over i j in n of 1 over n cubed which is equal to 1 over n so the probability that even one of the vectors deviates one of the distances but one of the pairwise distances deviates is at most 1 over n Right, so this is the power of concentration plus the union bound. I needed to set k to be 1 over epsilon square to get rid of that epsilon square. And then I put a log n over there to get this probability down to polynomially small. I needed, I need this to be polynomially small so that I can union bound. So this is the magic. The magic is that I can set this just to be log n. And I can get my probability down so small that I can simply union bound over all the vectors. You see, this is where I get to ignore any structure amongst the vectors or any dependence. This allows me to ignore dependence. So I just ignore dependence. Right? It's completely oblivious to what the vectors are and how they're related because I can do union bound. 
And so this is essentially, you know, this is a proof sketch of of JL. Uh, you know, ignoring, of course, the the concentration that one has to show for the sums of squares of Gaussians. But if you assume that you, if the sums of squares of Gaussians behaves, sort of, you know, has sub Gaussian tails, then that is enough to complete the proof, and the proof is surprisingly short. So. Let me pause here and let me take any questions and then after that you know I will I can sort of give you some ideas on how these concentrations are proved and we can talk a little bit about the moment generating function. Okay so let me walk through the entire proof once more uh, and let me get my let me get my notes in order here all right so again Let's just go back to the beginning, where, where it all starts. We argue that for any set of n points in d-dimensional space, where epsilon is less than half, there exists a linear transformation which approximately preserves all distances. And the dimension, the, the, the target dimension, as this is often called, is at most, you know, is like O of log n by epsilon squared. And remarkably, this linear transformation that we construct is just a random linear transformation. Okay, so what is the random linear transformation? So remember the transformation matrix. Um, let me sort of sorry get rid of this. The transformation matrix is a k cross d matrix where k is going to be much smaller than d. K is going to be log n divided by epsilon square. Each entry of this matrix is an independent. Gaussian random variable with variance one. There is a lot of flexibility on what to choose, but you know, for getting the intuition of the proof and to understand what's going on, it's best to think of those as Gaussians. So what you have are k vectors. Each row is a vector where each entry was generated independently from the normal distribution. Okay, and so the map is obtained by taking dot products with each of these vectors. Now, for Gaussians, there are essentially just two things that I want you to understand. Well, actually, I should say there are three things. So, the first, let me just draw out an intuitive picture of what a Gaussian is. Actually, that is sort of related to the tail bound. The tail bound says, let's take a Gaussian that is centered at zero with a standard deviation of sigma, the variance being sigma squared. The probability of deviating more than k times so I should probably put an absolute value there. The probability of deviating more than k times the standard deviation is essentially exponential in minus k squared. What this means is as soon as you set k to be, you know, some large integer, l large positive integer, the probability is extremely small. A useful intuition is to actually think of the Gaussian, think of the Gaussian as simply a step function, a uniform distribution between minus sigma and sigma and sort of tiny probabilities decaying to zero outside sigma. Either tiny probabilities or even you can even think of it as just zero. These are exponentially decaying probabilities here. But between plus sigma and minus sigma, between the standard deviation, it's essentially a roughly uniform distribution. This is a useful intuition to have if you want to understand what the moments of the Gaussian are going to look like. Okay, so that gives you the tail bound. Now the second property is a linear combination of independent Gaussians is also a Gaussian and it's easy to write out what the variance is. So if you take summation of alpha i z i then the variance is basi basically the summation of alpha i square, sigma i square, where sigma i is the variance. Sigma i square is the variance of zi. Okay, so this is the linear combination property, fundamental properties of Gaussians. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to essentially cons consider an arbitrary vector or point u in R to the D. Eventually, we are going to set U to be VI minus VJ. Right? This is eventually what we are going to set U to be. And therefore, what we would like to understand is really what does the length uh, of phi 
what is the Euclidean norm of field? This is what we want to look at. We want to look at the Euclidean norm of the projection of a vector u. So uh, of the embedding, I should say, of the embedding of u. And the embedding is constructed by taking a bunch of independent projections. So let's take a random projection. Now random projection is going to be u dot x, the vector x where each entry is an independent Gaussian. So what we have is let's look at the random variable u dot x, which is the projection of u. I should actually say the dot product of u with a random vector, but I want you to think of it as a projection. I have not normalized it, but you know, let's leave that aside. So let's look at the coordinates of u, which is alpha 1 to alpha d, where each alpha j is an r, is a real number. The random variable y is basic, is just the summation of alpha j, xj. Each xj is an independent Gaussian. And as we said, a linear combinations of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So y is also distributed as a Gaussian with variance exactly being the Euclidean norm of u squared. So what this means, and I state that as a lemma, is that for any vector u, u dot x is a Gaussian that's distributed as with you know mean zero and variance being exactly the Euclidean norm squared. So now that we, we have this, we can now go on to our next step. And the next step is to look at the Euclidean norm of the projection of the embedding squared. And so if you look at the embedding, so you basically just square each of the individual entries of the embedding just to get the Euclidean norm squared. And each of these is yj, right? So we can write out the length of the embedding as 1 over k. This is just a normalization factor that I added. So if that bothering you, you can remove that and then you know divide everything later on by k. What's important is that you get the sum of squares of Gaussians. Right? This is what the norm of the embedding of u looks like. So what is the expectation of this norm? So this is simply by linearity of expectation is the sum of the expected value of each yj squared. But we know that yj is a Gaussian. And so this uh, Ga Gaussian centered at 0. So this is exactly the variance of the Gaussian, which is the Euclidean norm of u squared. So all of that works out. And you get the Euclidean norm squared. And, I'll, and um, just to say it. Uh, again, the, the, the expectation of the summation of yj squared, this expectation, the expectation of that is k times u squared. So now we're looking at this random variable, which is the sums of squares of independent Gaussians. And we need tail bounds for this. This, you know, maybe in the next, uh, once I finish this summary, I will try to talk about how one can get results of that form. But let's first just hope that summation of yj squared behaves like what we would like it to behave. So let's first look at the variance of yj squared. Now for the variance, I can just look at the sums of individual variances. So let me just look at y1, which is the first random variable. I'm looking at the expectation of y1 to the fourth minus the expectation of you know y1 squared squared. Now by the rule of thumb, we can think of yi being uniformly distributed between the standard deviation. The standard deviation is is the Euclidean norm. Is the remember the variance of the Euclidean norm squared. Standard deviation is the Euclidean norm. So if you had yi being uniformly distributed here, then the expectation of yi to the fourth is just going to be the fourth power of this quantity. Right? And this is a calculation that's easy like it's sort of easy to work out. So if this was uniformly distributed here, the fourth power is just going to be the fourth power of, of the Euclidean norm. And so the variance, using just the rule of thumb, like this is not a formal proof, but just to see the math, the variance of yi squared is, remember, the, the variance of yi squared, right? Not the variance of yi. So the variance of yi squared is the fourth power of the Euclidean norm. Okay, now let's go back, plug everything in. So the expectation of the summation of yj squared is k times the Euclidean norm squared. The standard deviation is root k times the, the, times the Euclidean norm squared. And I got the Euclidean norm squared because the variance had the fourth power. I took a square root to get to the second power. 
Okay, now let me look at what I expect. Let me look at the probability of deviating more than epsilon times the expectation. So I do my usual math of trying to express the deviation as some number of multiples of the standard deviation. And if you crunch out the numbers, you get that the deviation is epsilon root k times the standard deviation. Right? And you get a root k here because, well, let me work this out. So epsilon times the expectation is epsilon k Euclidean norm squared, which you write as epsilon root k times root k times the Euclidean norm of u squared. And this is an upper bound on the standard deviation. And so what you get is the probability is e to the minus epsilon square k divided by some constant. right? So this statement here has no dependence on the Euclidean norm of u itself. It only depends on epsilon, which is you know the, the, the approximation, and k, which is the number of dimensions. OK, so at this point, we are now ready to wrap things up. So what we have is for all u, the probability that the embedding square norm is not a good approximation of the true norm. Right? This is the probability the embedding norm is not a good approximation of the true norm. Is at most e to the minus epsilon square k divided by some constant c. Right? This is by doing our rules of thumb. And this holds, so for all u, this holds. Be careful about the, the order of quantifiers. I'm not saying that with some probability it holds for all u. I'm just saying for all u, it holds with some probability. Now I'm going to set k, which is the number of dimensions, to be 3c natural log of n divided by epsilon square. Plug this in, you'll get the probability is at most 1 over n cube. And I want it to be so small so that now I can just union bound over all pairs. So I'm going to apply this theorem for vi minus vj which is u. My vector is now just going to be vi minus vj, which is what I was interested in initially. And I just do a union bound over all pairs, and there are n square pairs, you know, but the probability of each bad event happening is 1 over n cubed, and I get a 1 over n in the end, and sort of that sort of completes the argument. So any questions about that? Yes. Is there a way you wouldn't go back because you would in some sense necessarily lose information because you're going to a lower dimensional space but in some sense the question is why do you want to go back I mean typically what you're doing is you want to sort of represent everything in lower dimensional space so that you can then manipulate the dimensions there directly so what you should think about is, in some sense, what are the dimensions? The dimensions are just some way of representing your points. And so if you're assuming some kind of rotational symmetry in the sense that I don't care about what my specific embedding is, what my specific axes are, as long as the distances between points are preserved, then what you're effectively doing is you're thinking of like taking a random so think of it another way. So if I took my initial points and I rotated them, I rotate the axes. Sorry, not the points. So rotate the axes. Do you still consider yourself having the same set of points or not? Right? And in applications where you do, that means you have some kind of rotational invariance. And typically, you're interested in the distances between points. Like if you were to think about similarity in a lot of machine learning settings, it's points that are close to, you know, you represent each, let's say, person or entity as a point, and you say points that are close or similar. In this case, your definition is rotationally symmetric. So you, you can actually move to a lower dimensional embedding where all the distances are preserved. 
that's 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 the goal yeah but, i mean you can think of it from an application standpoint but you can also think about it from the pure mathematical standpoint as this is just like a remarkable statement about geometry so i have um i have 10 minutes here so there are actually um Okay, so there, there, are, there are a few things that, that, I, that I want to say. You know, I was hoping to talk maybe about the moment generating function and some of those methods, but maybe what I'll do is, you know, I'll defer that to another lecture. And, you know, I can talk more about how to prove these sort of concentrations. Instead, what I want to do is I just want to make a few comments on Johnson Lindenstrauss, on the JL lemma, and maybe dispel. Um, this is often interpreted in, in my opinion, it's often interpreted in the wrong way, uh, even by, by, a lot of, by a lot of theorists. Um, and, and, and that has to do with sort of the applications. So you'll see that, you know, JL is interpreted as, you know, um, we have a low dimensional embedding that preserves Euclidean structure. Now, it depends on how you actually define Euclidean structure. If you define it in terms of distances, yes. But, you know, sort of comment one that I'll make is JL does not preserve dot products. Now it's easy to confuse the two. So let's say suppose all VIs have unit norm. Right? So everything everything is basically sitting on the unit sphere. Okay, so you can say what is the distance What is that distance, the Euclidean norm? Let's say it's x squared. And you'll get it's the Euclidean norm of Vi squared plus the Euclidean norm of Vj squared minus 2 times Vi dot Vj. And so what you get is you get 2 times 1 minus Vi dot Vj. Now, what's very important to note is that while there's an easy relationship between the dot product and the distance, approximate distance, approximate distance is not the same as approximate dot product. Approximate distance is not the same as approximate dot product. Okay? And so I have I have seen this being mentioned many times that when they have an when people have an application where they want to preserve dot products they'll take a low dimensional embedding I say wait a second a low dimensional embedding preserves the distance not the dot product an easy way to see that is suppose all the VIs suppose the VIs were all orthogonal okay. So they're unit vectors, which are all orthogonal, which means that the distance between any two of them is square root 2. So if you project into low dimensional space, you will preserve the fact that their distances are approximately root 2. But when you move to a low dimensional space, they will not remain orthogonal any longer. They will not remain orthogonal any longer. Okay, so if, yes? Mm -hmm. So it depends. Okay, so l l let's let me me. So you know, here's your initial triangle, right? And 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 you're going to transform this triangle where maybe it's going to look a bit like this, where this is 1 plus minus epsilon, 1 plus minus epsilon, root 2 plus minus epsilon. 
the angle between here was zero. The angle over here is not going to be zero. It's going to be some additive epsilon. So the dot product, so you could say that vi dot vj was initially zero, and vi dot vj is now approximately epsilon. This is not a multiplicative approximation. This is an additive approximation. Whereas for distances, you had a multiplicative approximation. So the approximation that you get for dot product is additive, not multiplicative. Does that make sense? You do not preserve dot products to 1 plus minus epsilon. Because if you did, then if a dot product was 0, you would have to exactly get 0 as the approximation. You get an additive approximation. But often, the additive approximation is, is not good enough in many applications. Whereas for dist, so I should write this out. So for distance, it's a multiplicative, which is a strong approximation. For dot products, it's additive, which is a weak approximation. And I've seen multiple people confuse them, where they assume that strong here means strong over there. And they'll say, oh, you have a good approximation for the dot product. Good is only up to additive. So in, in there have been, and I've dealt with some of these applications, where you want to distinguish nearly orthogonal vectors from truly orthogonal vectors. And this approach will fail. Because truly orthogonal vectors will become nearly orthogonal once you do this. You can apply this for different metrics, and there is there is some work on that. So in general, then you can look at. You have to be you know. You have to be careful because I mean in this case, so there is a whole sort of um, there's a whole field of what's called metric embeddings, where you try to embed one metric into another metric, approximately preserving distance. So here, what you can think of is we've taken Euclidean metric in high dimensions and preserved it in Euclidean metric in a lower dimensional space. The techniques here are all very specific to rotational invariance, so they're only going to work for Euclidean norms. Right? In general, random projections only make sense when you are rotationally invariant. But yes, there is a whole field of, of preserving other kinds of distances. So I don't think you can, now if you think about it, if you have n orthogonal vectors, there's no way you can have n orthogonal vectors in less than n dimensional space. Sure. So actually preserving dot products is, you know, up to one plus minus epsilon is not possible. And th there's, there are fairly strong, like, constraints on that. And um, indeed, like, I don't know, like this, uh, I've mentioned this uh, lower bound that I have on um, on uh, low dimensional embedding methods for graphs. That's actually what it exploits. That's part of what it says. It says that you cannot preserve dot products when you move to a lower dimensional space. So the second comment is log n over epsilon square is not necessarily small. You know, depending on application, and and this is this is this is again this is a big misnomer. I, I frankly I think amongst theory folks will say, oh, there's always a low-dimensional embedding. Well, it depends. I think one over epsilon square isn't necessarily small, and so let me let me sort of tell you why. So let me let's say that n was I don't know. Let's say it was was um, ten million points. Now, you know, if you wanted epsilon to be 0 0.01, which in some applications you do, you want like you know 99% accuracy. You know, log n over epsilon square, and you also have some sort of constant sitting over here. 
So the 1 over epsilon square is going to be 100 squared times the log n, you know, which let's say approximately also gives you another factor of, of 10. And over here you're already looking at something just by this which is 10 to the 5 and you gave another factor of 10 because of the constants, you're at 10 to the 6. So you're actually at a pretty high dimensional embedding. You know, typically when you want to do dimension reduction in practice, you want to reduce it to something like 100 dimensions. Very rarely are people going to consider something which is like 10,000 dimensions as low dimensions. So, you know, the dependence on epsilon, the dependence on epsilon, it, it hurts, uh, and, and provably so. There are lower bounds showing that you have to pay epsilon square. You know, and sometimes you actually need epsilon to depend on n, and, and so then it's not necessarily small. And comment three, which is also often missed in practice, is the representation size increases, or I should say potentially, and again, let's let's see why that's the case. So let's say here's my original matrix. So it's V1 to Vn. Now I'm multiplying by this. So this is D, uh, this is this is N, this is D. And what I end up with is N times K. So it's like, oh look, I've actually reduced the size. But remember, if I look if I call this matrix V, the storage is the number of non-zeros of V, right? This is the number of non-zeros because I don't have to store the zeros. And in many applications, the number of non-zeros is going to be O of N. But when you go here, because these are random Gaussians, this might be sparse, but this is often almost always dense. And so now your storage is now omega n times k, which is omega n log n divided by epsilon square. And while you can afford to pay logs, log n factors in time, in storage, this is extremely expensive. So you might take data, which is like a couple terabytes, and you might be increasing it by a factor of 10 or 100. And so this is one of the weaknesses of doing this sort of dimension reduction, which is why it often has bottlenecks in practice. So I've gone over time. So I just wanted to point these out because I think these are common misnomers. It's, again, the jail, it's a wonderful, it's a beautiful theorem, but one also has to know what its limitations are. Uh, and in the next lectures, uh, you know, I might try to go into some details about the moment generating function and how you prove these concentration bonds. So I'll stop here and I'll take any questions.